indeed for inviting me to speak at the, this event. It's, I'm aware of a very prestigious uh, set of lectures and very, very fine speakers, so I'm, I'm privileged to be here. And uh, I'd like to offer some insights into our recent experience. Uh, it seems only right that those of us in the UK competition regulatory regime should be ready and willing to give something back to our Irish counterparts. Because we've done so well of recruiting our senior staff from the <laughs> Irish regime. <laughs> it's, uh, and it's particularly a time to be here in, in Dublin today. With you in the process, I've been hearing of moving towards final limits in your own reforms to the competition regime, bringing together consumer and competition uh, expertise in the same organisation. And that, I emphasise, is a key feature of the UK regime, both before and after our reforms. And there are many other similarities and parallels to be drawn, for example, in securing the best use of additional resources and in working to tackle closed sectors and other markets not yet fully exposed to a full effective competition. Um, and Ireland has been looking at these issues um, uh, alongside economic regulation as part of your national effort to restore economic vitality and growth, and that's received deserved plaudits around Europe. So what I'd like to do is take you through the changes to the UK competition and consumer protection regime, which will shortly be finalised. We came into existence in October. <coughs> in, March, in, in April, we take our powers, and the Office of Fair Trading and the Competition Commission shut their doors on March the 31st. Um, and I'll start with a, a, a brief look at the rationale for these changes, and then discuss key aspects of the process, and then talk about what the changes have been made and how we got on in implementing them, and then conclude with some of the distinctive features of the new regime and how I think we'll be able to judge whether or not we succeeded in two or three years' time. We're in the enviable position of having been formed from two predecessors that were very far from fame. It's not usual for government to invest time and resources in revamping a regime that it believes to be world class. And even more unusual, when the motivation for reorganisation is not to save money. And to demonstrate that last point, um, in last year's budget, we received a 40% increase in our budget for 15-16, and in the autumn statement we got a large increase to help us where for next year. So this is not about saving money, indeed, it's about putting more into the competition and consumer regime. So why did government make the decision to merge the OFT and CC? Um, the answer, I think, is simple. Competition is a key driver for delivering greater productivity and growth in the UK economy, and particularly in the context of the financial crisis and recession, and the challenges that lie ahead in sustaining competitiveness. And the government believes, for reasons I'll explain, that actually this combination will deliver a more effective <coughs> regime, and I'm firmly of that view. There is, of course, abundant and growing evidence of the economic benefits that an effective competition regime can bring, um, not least in the fact that most countries have introduced their own regime, more than 100% to even Hong Kong is going in that direction. Uh, World Bank uh, Investment Climate compilation of research findings found a swathe of important results. Price drops of 20 to 40% after international cartels broken up. Uh, employment rates boosted by somewhere between 2.5 and 5 percentage points by reforms to state controls and barriers to competition. GDP gains of 2.5% from competition reforms in Australia. Net benefits of 100 million a year from merger controls in the Netherlands. Consumer savings from cartel enforcement in the US over eight years, some uh, 1.85 billion US dollars. So robust competition policy is vital for ensuring economic growth, rewarding businesses that innovate to satisfy consumers, and encouraging new entry and new investment in the market. The research for the European Commission found a robust positive effect of competition policy on total factor of productivity, growth for some 22 industries in 12 OECD countries over a, 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 a decade. And the LSE Growth Commission report similarly pointed to increased and more effective competition 
and a strengthening of competition policy in the UK as a key contributor to economic gains in the period up to the recent financial crisis. And I think more broadly, there are gains to civil society in having firms confident that they're competing on a level playing field, consumers confident they can exercise meaningful choice, and citizens confident that the law is being upheld effectively by impartial public institutions. So, a powerful competition regime is a major prize. And the UK government took the view that despite a well-performing regime, there was scope for even better performance with its competition and consumer authorities. <laughs> and the potential benefits from that were the key driver in the government decisions to reform the law and institutions in this area. And not for nothing was the government's consultation document on its perform proposed reforms entitled A Competition Regime for Growth. There was a widespread consultation and deliberation that lasted a couple of years as we went from proposals to policy to legislation and finally to the establishment of the CMA last October. We've continued that open consultation and all those who have an interest have had an opportunity to inform everything from the government's initial proposal through its organisational values and its objectives in its first year of operation to our business plan which we published I think yesterday or the day before. Since our work affects almost everyone in the UK because of our economy-wide remit, this consultation seems to us to be entirely appropriate. We have an ongoing mission to explain and, in, to, and inform consumers, businesses and government about our role and our work. A very wide range of options for change were considered. In the end, the overall approach taken could be characterised as one of evolution, not revolution, building on the successes of the existing authorities and introducing new elements where there was a strong case for so doing. Hence the decision to bring together the OFT and CC. But other fundamental changes to the regime were considered and not pursued. For example, a move to a prosecutorial rather than an administrative competition enforcement regime was mooted and had its supporters but it would have meant starting from scratch, as opposed to building on the many lessons learnt by the existing authorities over the preceding decades. Fundamentally, the government came out strongly in favour of retaining the link between competition and consumer protection, and didn't take forward proposals to make the new CMA purely a competition regulator. There are vitally important links and synergies between the two areas of work Competitive markets provide choice and value for consumers, while for competition to work properly, consumers have to be able to confidently shop around. Competition problems often manifest themselves as failures of compliance with consumer protection law, preventing consumers from making informed choices and thus from thriving competition. And combining the mindset of competition and consumer specialists in a single organisation means that both perspectives can be applied to the same problems, bringing economic discipline to decisions as to how and whether to intervene to protect consumers, and adding a greater understanding of the real-world experience and concerns of consumers to the analysis of the functioning of markets. Importantly, the CMA also remains an authority for the whole of the UK, focusing on markets across the country, while taking account of different legal systems and other important contexts in the devolved nations. We thus retain a strong interest in competition and consumer issues in Northern Ireland, and hence in those markets that cross the Irish border. The biggest change to the UK regime that was adopted was the shift to a single authority, bringing together most of all of the OFT's consumer role and all of its competition work together with the Competition Commission in the new CMA. And there are a number of benefits to this shift. First, we can be more efficient as a single authority. One of the frequent criticisms of the previous regime was that it was slower than it could be, and in particular that businesses under investigation suffered because of duplication <coughs> of effort between the OFT and the CC. 
Whilst the CMA will retain the separation between the two stages in terms of decision making, it can reduce duplication in evidence gathering and other key aspects, and hence be more timely in its operation. Secondly, we can better manage our resources. The Competition Commission's workload it was, has been determined largely by referrals from the OFT, which meant that the Competition Commission has gone through feast, gone from feast to famine and back. Significant ebbs and flows that are difficult to manage in a small organisation. In a single organisation, we can deploy resources more efficiently across the two phases of our work. And thirdly, and importantly, we can be a stronger advocate for competition and consumer protection in the UK and abroad by virtue of having a single voice in this area. In designing the CMA, we've looked at the best, carefully at the best way to organise the authority to maximise these benefits, building a new organisation that is more than the sum of its parts. And whilst there have been some initial savings to be made from combining back office and support services, it's worth restating that that was not the objective of the merger. Hence, the substantial extra resource that's been given to us and invested back, it is going to be invested back into CMA frontline delivery. It may well be that that increase in resource is one of the major benefits of the, this reform process. Delivery will also be enforced by, reinforced by a raft of enhancements to competition law and the CMA's powers, which include an enhanced administrative approach to antitrust cases, improving the speed of the process and the robustness of decision making, along with new powers to require individuals to answer questions and to impose civil sanctions for failure to comply with investigations. There's a revised criminal cartel offence, removing the requirement to prove dishonesty in order to make the offence easier to prosecute, and thus maximising its deterrent effect. <laughs> New powers to gather information in market investigations, along with more demanding time limits for all the stages of these investigations, speeding up the competition process. Stronger powers to suspend and reverse integration between firms in merger cases, and to impose penalties for failure to comply. <coughs> as well as the introduction of statutory time limits, time scales for merger investigations, and time limited periods in which firms can negotiate undertakings in lieu of a referral of their merger for full consideration. These aren't wholesale changes, tweaks and advances, but I think uh, taken together, <coughs> they will represent a significant upgrade of the competition regime, building on improvements that the CMA's predecessors have already put in place. The process of reform has also brought an opportunity to review the mission and objectives of the competition authorities. The government has introduced a new strategic steer, setting out its expectations for the CMA at a high level. This has led to some raising of eyebrows and questions as to its effect on our independence from ministers. However, I think the steer is better understood as putting communication between government and the competition authorities, which inevitably happens, on a more transparent basis, and reflecting the importance of the competition regime as part of the government's economic toolkit. The steer doesn't bind the CMA, and our independent board will make up its own independent mind on issues, but we have to have regard for it, and we rather acknowledge the reality that Independent regulators have to be sensitive to commercial and political developments and need, therefore, to maintain dialogue with government. <coughs> a key element of the government's first strategic steer to the CMA is the need for a more proactive use of competition law in regulated sectors such as energy and water. The CMA has been given a stronger remit to work with regulators in those sectors. We've already established a UK competition network with the concurrent regulators to help to ensure a consistent and effective use of competition powers across the economy. Um, those of you who follow British politics will know that there's much political pressure for action to improve competition in banking as well as energy and other similar market sectors at present. And this will be an important area of work for us. <coughs> Another change to our mission is our role on the international stage. Both the government and the CMA attach much significance to this work. 
And it's no coincidence that the CMA's new primary duty in legislation is specifically to seek to promote competition both within and outside the UK for the benefit of consumers. This might be misinterpreted as a somewhat imperialist uh, uh, injunction. I interpret it as a stepping up of our international role, working with competition regulators uh, internationally uh, to, to, to good advantage. We are committed to having a real influence on the international stage, as the OFT and CC have in the past, and to cooperating with the competition and consumer authorities in different countries. The OFT and CC already have a pick-up-the-phone relationship with overseas regulators, including his older colleague and her colleagues at the TCA here in Dublin. And, and, and there's always, but there's always more that we can do. So while improved international cooperation will help us with our own cases, we'll also work with partners overseas to share our experience, to disseminate best practice, and to drive the convergence of standards and rules. The CMA will look to take forward the cooperation uh, on specific cases and projects. And just to give a few examples, the OFT has recently been cooperating with a range of overseas partners as part of its focus on online sales channels and digital markets. Cases involving e-books, Amazon, and hotels, online booking have all involved a significant degree of cross-border cooperation and have been uh, <coughs> delivering real benefits to consumers. In last year, the OFT began looking at online and app-based games and identified market-wide practices that it considered were non-compliant with the relevant legislation. And I could add a bit of colour to that, perhaps in discussions. Uh, the OFT produced a set of draft principles to clarify its views and has since promoted those principles with international counterparts through the International Consumer Protection and Enforcement Network. And there's been agreement that the principles strike a suitable balance to indicate how businesses should treat its consumers, and they're likely to influence other ICPEN member agencies' input into their own consumer law. Exactly the sort of success that we'll be looking to replicate and build on. Of course, the context in which we and other regulators work is changing at a furious pace, and we need to remain flexible and adapt to a range, what, to a range of changing circumstances. The CMA will be launching into a continuing stream of regulatory reform. While we are taking on the OFT's consumer protection role, that role significantly changed last year as part of the government's drive to reform the consumer protection regime, with local authorities trading standards taking on a more national role, and the OFT focusing on cases with market wide <coughs> implications. Those changes and the institutional reforms around them are still bedding in, and the CMA is absolutely determined to play its full part in that and make it work. Other regulators in health and financial services have recently gained or are gaining new competition powers and responsibilities. Legislation on consumer rights is going through Parliament, and the government is currently reviewing the balance of competences between the UK and the EU in competition and consumer policy. We'll, and as I said, we'll be working closely with the sector regulators to ensure more effective use of competition policy in regulated sectors, and it's worth recording that in the UK, the regulated sectors account for more than 25% of the economy, and is therefore very critical. So our UK competition network, deliberately modelled on the European competition network, um, which coordinates competition enforcement across EU member states, um, uh, we, that, the, the, the ECM, is 10 years old and is widely regarded in the competition world as a great success. We hope the same will be said of the UK CM in a decade to come. So, how will we look to achieve the mission that we've been tasked at the end of what's been quite a long process of reform and renewal? Our broad objective is to be, our ambition is to be a world leading competition and consumer agency at the forefront of delivering important results and innovation on a consistent basis and across our portfolio, a balanced, wide portfolio. And so we set ourselves five strategic objectives to sit below that, which we'll need to achieve. The first is effective enforcement of the law, protecting consumers and deterring anti-competitive behaviour. That is the bedrock of our credibility as an organisation and the most obvious measure by which we'll be judged. Put simply, we can't be an effective agency if we fail in our core business. Extending the frontiers of competition into new areas, 
whether that's new or rapidly changing markets, new ways of looking at consumer behavior, or areas where competition and markets have not previously been used, including public services. Refocusing consumer protection, following the reforms that I mentioned uh, a moment ago, using our enforcement powers appropriately, and leading on policy developments in some areas. Achieving professional excellence across all our work, whether in legal and economic analysis, case management, or any other area, and ensuring we don't impose unnecessary burdens on business. And integrating our performance into internally, through combining different professional approaches and backgrounds, and through careful selection and combination of our tools for intervening in markets, and externally, working with a full range of bodies, and I've mentioned a lot of them in my work so far, working effectively with a full range of bodies with whom we share powers and interests. Now, we've got most of the CMA in place. We'll come into, we'll move into our new home to, together in, in March. Um, and and uh, uh, we will, uh, the infrastructure that we need will be in place to be ready to be effective. But by far the most important aspect of the CMA is its people. I'm delighted to be the board of a chair, uh, the chairman of a board that includes former heads of the European Commission Competition uh, Agency and the US Competition Agencies, as well as members with vast business and academic experience. We've also got a great leadership team headed up by Alex Chisholm, who many of you will know from his time here, uh, and made up of both recruits from outside and from the existing authorities. <coughs> uh, and we have a very good group of people in the two existing agencies who will be carrying on in, 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 in the new organisation. That gives us organisational memory and gives us a talented and committed body of people a chance to build on their own legacy of important achievement for consumers. I'd like to close with some thoughts on what success might look like over the course of the next two to three years. Not in terms of the CMA's performance per se, but in terms of the outcomes of the programme of reform overall. In addition to delivering authority that achieves its ambitions and its strategic goals, we also need to look to some distinctive features of the new regime and how well they've succeeded in order properly to judge the extent to which the forms have worked. <coughs> One of the most valued aspects of the existing regime is the clear separation of the two phases of decision-making for mergers and market investigations, with the second phase bringing a fresh pair of eyes. The challenge of building the CMA has, to, has been to make that work within one organisation, under one roof, ensuring we don't allow the risk of confirmation bias, while still allowing the new organisation to be more efficient in its handling of cases. Another key challenge has been to ensure that the decision not to move to a prosecutorial model for antitrust enforcement is not regretted by building on the current and much improved administrative approach. That includes enhancements such as case decision groups, which are intended to improve decision making in antitrust cases and watching carefully to see that they work well. Politicians have set a high bar for the CMA to be an enhanced competition <coughs> in regulated market sectors, and the ever increasing focus on competition in areas like energy and financial services will mean that this is a high profile area of our work. Through the UKCN and bilateral work with our partners, we'll need to deliver measurable improvements in this area. In consumer protection, we'll have important precedent setting cases to deliver, as well as working with our partners to ensure that the new system adds up to more than the sum of its parts. More broadly, we'll also need to make the maximum use of the synergies between competition and consumer work, using both in appropriate measure and in an integrated way. It's worth noting that there is what might be termed a, a lab experiment in different approaches to competition and consumer regulation going, across, going on across the EU right now. In the UK and France, for example, there will be only one competition body, where other countries, such as Portugal, have two. Ireland will join the UK and others in combining competition and consumer in one agency, while others keep competition separate. And in the Netherlands and Spain, Competition and sector regulation are tackled by unitary bodies, as opposed to having separate bodies with varying degrees of coordination. Time will tell which approaches are the most successful, and we hope to learn much from the comparisons and contrasts. But I'm quite confident that we will be amongst the successful. <laughs>
In the end, though, the biggest question for the CMA will be whether the organisation that it becomes and the outputs it creates, produces can justify the efforts of all who have been involved in creating a new, more powerful, unitary competition and consumer authority. This has been no mean task. And it will be for the CMA to demonstrate that all that work has been worthwhile, helping competition to play its full role in driving economic growth and delivering important individual outcomes for consumers and businesses. It's not a simple task, but we relish the challenge to deliver those benefits to consumers, businesses and the economy. And we look forward to refining and improving our approach through learning and sharing our experience with our fellow members of the European Competition Network and other international colleagues. Thank you very much for your attention. I think you've been to us.